Faulkner, Cass Sunstein, Charles Ogletree, Ken Feinberg, and Wilma Lehman. Professor Convitt's uh, little background on him, he was born in 1908 and emigrated to the United States in 1915, becoming a citizen of this country in 1926. He received his bachelor's and law degrees in 1930 from NYU and a PhD uh, from, in philosophy from Cornell in 1933. He was known as a remarkable teacher, but also a scholar and citizen. Uh, he was an authority on constitutional labor law um, and civil and human rights. And he served here on the faculty from 1946 until 1973, passing away in 2003 at the age of 95. He was a devoted public servant of our university, including serving as a founder of the university's Department of Near Eastern Studies and its program on Jewish studies. So uh, this le lecture commemorates the great legacy that um, he uh, had uh, teaching many over the years, including uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who uh, in her papers uh, uh, recognized him as one of her mentors uh, when she was an undergraduate student here at Cornell. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Andreas, who's going to be speaking today. As I mentioned, she is the Patricia D. and R. Paul Yetter Professor of Law at Columbia University, where she's taught since 2021. Uh, previously, she was a professor at Michigan Law School. Uh, she mm -hmm. teaches and writes in the fields of constitutional law, labor law, and administrative law. Her scholarship probes the failures of U.S. law to protect workers' rights, examines the effects of historical and contemporary worker movements to transform legal structures, and now analyzes how labor law and constitutional governance might be reformed to enable greater political and economic democracy. Drawn from constitutional law, administrative law, and legal history perspectives, she's also explored the relationship between law and the perpetuation of economic inequality. She frequently provides advice on policy initiatives to legislators and workers' rights organizations and works on related litigation. Prior to law school, Professor Andreas worked for several years as an organizer with the Service Employees International Union. We were just talking about how that was the first time she came up here for a worker program up here at Cornell. Uh, after receiving a JD from Yale Law School, she clerked for Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and also for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Cornell Class of 59, <laughs> uh, and Supreme Court Justice. Uh, Press Andreas practiced political law at Perkins Coy and served as Associate Counsel and Special Assistant to Pre President Barack Obama and as Chief of Staff in the White House Counsel's Office. It's a great pleasure to welcome her here this year to give our Congress lecture. Press Andreas. <laughs> Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for that introduction. Um, I feel really honored um, to, to be asked to give this lecture um, named after Professor Milton Convitz. Like Professor Convitz, I teach and research in the areas of constitutional law and labor law, although I thought it was important to say at the outset how I can I do not compare. Um, among other things, I'm astounded by the fact that he never gave the same lecture twice. <laughs> really amazing feat, I think, for a professor. So as Dee Colvin mentioned um, in his opening remarks, I had the good fortune to clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a student of Professor Colvin. That's when she attended Cornell as an undergraduate. And in preparing for this lecture, I was curious about their relationship. And I took a look at their correspondence, which Cornell has collective. One letter the justice sent to Professor Convitz jumped out at me. On April 10th, 2001, nearly 50 years after she had been a student, Justice Ginsburg wrote to Professor Convitz, Dear Milton, you opened my eyes to the possibility of realizing human rights at a time that was not the best for our nation and world, with appreciation for the latest work of your fine hand Ruth. That was the letter in its entirety, and the format of the note brought back a flood of memories. Justice Ginsburg had an uncanny ability to pack a tremendous amount of meaning into very few words. When she spoke to us, even in chambers, she chose each word carefully, often pausing for long periods, leaving the rest of us in the room unsure if we should pick up the conversation or wait for the next well-considered 
word <laughs> to be uttered. <laughs> and her precision extended to punctuation. It was not infrequent that she would return even an informal note, for example, a recommendation on the top of a uh, memo about a petition for certiorari, the faint marks correcting our grammar, um, our syntax, or even an errant apostrophe. But the letter to Professor Convitz is, of course, more meaningful for its substance. Just as Ginsburg had been a student of Professor Convitz in the early 1950s, this was just a decade after the Holocaust, and the country was still in the throes of McCarthyism. Jim Crow still reigned. Brown versus Board of Education had not yet been decided. In addition, our law still contained countless sex-based classifications, disallowing women the ability to administer estates, serve on juries, and work in all professions on an equal basis to men. States could still prohibit contraception, and abortion was a crime in many states. It was a time, in Justice Ginsburg's words, that was not the best for our nation and world. When Justice Ginsburg wrote to Professor Commons in April of 2001, half a century later, times were again not the best for our nation and world, at least in her view. The 2000 election had recently occurred, and the Supreme Court had decided the Bush versus Gore case in which it claimed for itself, with very little doctrinal basis, if any, the power to determine the presidency of the United States and with it, the future of the nation. Justice Ginsburg was in vehement dissent in that case, as she would be in so many important cases in the future on such topics as the affirmative action, abortion, equal pay for women workers, the right of workers to pursue claims collectively, gun control, and the ability of Congress to regulate campaign finance and voting rights. But as dark as April 2001 might have been, times today are, I think, even darker. We are even more in need of Professor Convitz's commitment to the possibility of realizing human rights when times are not the best for our nation and world. In 2020, we witnessed a coup attempt that occurred with the support of our then president. Participation in these efforts was not limited to fringe characters. One leader of the January 6th insurrection, who is now in prison, was a classmate of mine from law school. Mm. Many elected officials supported the basic aims of January 6th, and many more have since refused to condemn them. Meanwhile, from the Supreme Court, we face a rollback of fundamental liberties and basic principles of equality, principles that enable us to have a democracy in which we all participate on roughly equal terms. In the last year, the Supreme Court has taken away the right to reproductive freedom, undermining women's rights to live as equal citizens in our society. And it did so on the ground that the right was not deeply rooted in American traditions, traditions that themselves have excluded women from voting, owning property, and working as equals. The court has also disabled the government from addressing pressing problems such as climate change, using a newly invented doctrine in administrative law that assumes Congress did not intend to grant agencies the ability to address questions of economic and political significance. Just yesterday, it granted a new administrative law case that could further erode judicial deference to administrative agencies and with it governmental power to protect the public interest. And with cases still pending this term, the court threatens, among other things, to limit the ability of workers to engage in strikes, free from crippling sanction under state tort law, and to take away the ability of universities, schools, and eventually employers to engage in practices attentive to diversity, to attempt to remedy the history of racial subjugation that defines our country. But the crisis facing our country goes beyond the Supreme Court and beyond the former president. Income inequality in the United States is at stunningly high levels, leading some commentators to call this the second gilded age. The statistics are probably familiar to all of you, but I think they are worth repeating. The wealthiest 1% of Americans takes home nearly a quarter of our national income and owns nearly one third of our nation's wealth. The problem is not just the extreme gap between the rich and poor, but the daily lived experience of most Americans who cannot make ends meet, who struggle to pay for housing, healthcare, and college for their children. One recent study estimates that about 5% of workers do not have secure employment, but rather serve as contractors, temp seasonal workers, or in other contingent relationships. Another study puts the number as high as 30%. Mm -hmm. 
over the um, over 10% of the nation's population lives below the poverty line. And after many years of stagnation, real wages have picked up a bit, but the gains are being eroded by inflation. Meaning um, working people have less economic mobility than in the past decades as well, with mobility particularly limited for children born into poverty. But perhaps the biggest problem, the overarching problem that unites all of those issues is that we have a political system that disables majorities from addressing these issues. Working people have shockingly little influence at every level of politics and government. Perhaps then it should not be surprising that a recent NPR Ipsos poll finds that 64% of Americans believe US democracy is in crisis and at risk of failing. Another study shows that a majority of American voters across nearly all demographics and ideologies believes our system of government just does not work. Around the world, there are similar trends. Most people still believe in democracy, but they too increasingly feel their countries are not democratic enough. Um, and that sentiment is giving rise not only to frustration and despair, but also to growing authoritarian movements. From one vantage point, questions of labor and of unions, questions that are at the heart of this institution, might seem to be tangential to questions of democracy and to the problem of rising authoritarianism. But with my remaining time, I wanna make the case that in fact, how we organize work, the extent to which workers can exercise power over their lives through collective organizations is absolutely fundamental to the crisis of democracy. Or put more, more positively, the revitalization of unions and the rebuilding of collective organizations among workers, the reform of labor law are critical to the future of our democracy. So earlier in my career, um, as Dean Colvin mentioned, I practiced election law and I worked in the White House. Um, I also worked as outside counsel to several presidential campaigns. In those circles and in, among political law scholars, labor is not typically front of mind when people talk about democracy. A democracy typically means fair elections. Joseph Schumpeter, the famous political economist, defined democracy as the institutional arrangement for arriving at political decisions in which individuals acquire the power to decide by means of a competitive struggle for the people's vote. To the extent many scholars and commentators are now worried about the fate of democracy, that's usually what they're focused on. But if we are to save democracy or to rebuild it or to build it, I think we have to have in mind as well a thicker version of democracy. At the most basic level, a democracy is a society in which power is shared by everyone in the community rather than reserved to the few. A democracy is a society in which all members stand in relation to one another, roughly as political and social equals. And a democracy requires the eradication of economic and social disparities that enable some individuals or groups to dominate others in both public and private life, in both politics and in people's daily on the ground lives. This is the conception I think we should have in mind when we talk about democracy, when we talk about saving democracy or rebuilding democracy. By this metric, our democratic crisis is dire. In fact, far more dire even than if we just focus on January 6th. But by this metric, I think there's also real reason for hope as new and exciting efforts among workers to gain a collective voice in their workplaces and in the democracy are underway. So to make my case, I wanna cover three main points. First, I will highlight the fundamental contradiction between the state of the contemporary workplace and a commitment to democracy. Second, I will review some of the research on why and how unions are so critical to democracy. And third, I'll argue for a form of labor law reform designed to help build a more democratic future. And we'll offer some thoughts on why, despite that, the fact that these are, I think, once again, not the best times, we should nonetheless be hopeful. So first, the workplace. Most people spend the vast majority of their lives at work. And for most people, especially low-income people, workplaces are decidedly not democratic. Quite the contrary, they are characterized by autocratic power. Workers have little influence over their wages, their schedules, their benefits, their patterns of work. Most have no right to take paid time off when they have a new child or a sick parent. Most can be fired for any reason or no reason at all, save legally prescribed causes like race and sex discrimination. And increasingly workers are under surveillance or electronic monitoring 
working under regimes that are quite analogous to authoritarian political regimes in that sense. So consider Amazon workers. An Amazon worker earning 15, a $15 hour wage would need to work about 24 hours a day for about 68 years just to earn what the former head of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, made in one hour um, as of 2018. And the demands on them are extraordinary. Numerous delivery workers have reported being so pressured to meet production rates, they do not have time for bathroom breaks, and so they use plastic bottles in their vans. Meanwhile, Amazon surveils its warehouse workers every move through the use of cameras and scanners, determining whether each worker is spending time off task, which they also call TOT. Supervisors keep a tally of each worker's TOT down to the minute. TOT can include chatting with coworkers, stopping to take a drink, and sometimes even a trip to the bathroom. After accumulating more than 30 minutes of time off task on a given day, workers are interrogated or disciplined and repeat offenses lead to termination. But nearly, nearly all of that is permissible under existing labor and employment law. Like most other US workers, these workers have little ability to influence their conditions at work. They have no power over the daily decisions that affect their lives because they have no organization through which they can collectively bargain the terms of their employment with their employer. They're not unionized. Indeed, only about 6% of private sector employees in the US are members of unions, which represents a really sharp decline from the 1950s when over 30% um, were. When workers do try to organize unions, they're met with intense campaigns of coercion and intimidation, much of which is illegal, but which results in few penalties. So for anyone fundamentally committed to democracy, the conclusion I think is inescapable. Labor law must be reimagined to bring the contemporary workplace and economic life more generally closer into line with basic democratic commitments. But even for those who are not committed to the idea of democratic rights at work, even for those who are focused only on the ability to vote or the need to avoid authoritarian rule in government, rethinking labor law and rebuilding unions are critical, even indispensable to rebuilding democracy. So to the second point, the connection between labor and political democracy. A significant and growing body of scholarship demonstrates that strong democratic unions are essential to political democracy. Angela Cornell on the ILR and law school faculties just published a terrific anthology that collects some of this research. Um, unions strengthen political democracy through several mechanisms. They increase rates of political participation among workers. They aggregate workers' political voice in ways that produce more representative government and more redistributive policy. They strengthen social ties, serving as a bulwark against racial divisions on which authoritarianism and ethno-nationalism prey. <clears throat> and by decreasing economic inequality, they also limit one of the conditions that enables right-wing populists to thrive. So undoubtedly unions do not always serve these democratic functions, but the evidence is pretty compelling that they have particular capacity to do so. So consider first unions effect on political participation. Union members are more likely to vote, to protest, to sign petitions, to lobby their legislators, to file comments with administrative agencies, and to do this at all three levels of government, local, state, and federal. These effects hold for all union members, but they are strongest for individuals with low levels of education. When I was a union organizer, I made countless trips to the state capitol with workers. Many had never voted prior to joining a union. But through the process of trying to change their conditions at work and in their communities, um, they became deeply engaged with problems of, for example, nursing home funding, wages, nursing home staffing levels, housing policy, health and safety, and many other policy issues, testifying before committees, meeting one-on-one -on -one with legislators, organizing neighbors to vote, and attending protests. Notably, higher union rates and active union organizing in a community correlate with greater political participation, not only among those members, but among all working people in the community. For example, one study found that self-described working class citizens and citizens of color, whether unionized or not, were far more likely to vote when unions ran dedicated political campaigns in their congressional district. Second, the evidence shows that unions produce more representative government. They serve as a countervailing force against the disproportionate power that wealthy corporations exercise in politics. This affects the kinds of candidates that succeed and the public policies that prevail. There's a pretty stunning and compelling series of studies published by Martin Gillens at Princeton 
He and several co-authors have demonstrated that when the public policy preferences of the poor and wealthy diverge, federal legislatures show no responsiveness to the poor, zero responsiveness. That changes, the studies show, only when those people are organized. Put differently, higher unionization rates produce more representative government, and more representative government also means more redistributive policy, benefiting working people far beyond those actually in unions. <clears throat> U.S. states with high unionization rates tend to have more progressive systems of taxation and more generous social welfare programs. Similar findings exist at the global level. Countries with stronger labor, labor movements tend to have more generous social benefits. Relatedly, strong unions, and in particular, high collective bargaining rates, are one of the most effective ways to reduce economic inequality, which is itself closely connected with declining democracy. So I mentioned that when legal scholars talk about the threat to democracy, they tend to focus on voting or often on increasing partisanship on, on polarization. But um, when regular people are asked what most poses a threat to democracy, their number one answer is economic inequality closely followed by related concerns, including that the government is acting only in the interest of a small group of people and that global corporations have too much power. Research from social scientists supports this lay perception. Economic inequality does correlate closely with the er erosion of democracy. So it shouldn't be su surprising that the decline of unions has contributed to the declining influence of workers in politics, the growing influence of the wealthy and growing concerns about democracy. Now, to be sure, lots of other factors contribute as well, including campaign fa finance laws, restrictions on voting, the increasing polarization of the media. But unions decline is one of the critical factors, given the many ways in which they engage in politics and the ways in which they bargain for redistribution of wealth from capital to workers. Unions effects are subjectively important as well as objectively important. Studies show that unionized workers have more faith in the possibility and promise of democracy. The very experience of being involved in democratic practices, both at work and in the political sphere, and helping produce governmental outcomes more aligned with their own interests, helps counteract the perception that government serves elites and is not responsive to ordinary people. Unions also guard against authoritarianism by serving as a force against social division on which ethno-nationalism preys. They provide one of the only opportunities in our society for people of different backgrounds to interact on a daily basis. The basic idea of a union is that members work toward a common goal, and this occurs across racial and ethnic lines and across political lines. Through collective struggle, unions thus help workers build connections with one another, and through those experiences, respect is gained and prejudices are weakened. I saw this firsthand on multiple occasions when I was a union organizer. I remember quite clearly one campaign in which a group of nursing home workers decided they wanted to organize their workplace. They endured extraordinarily long hours, frequently working the day shift seven to three and then going to another nursing home and working three to 11, just to pay rent. The facility was perpetually short staffed, the work was backbreaking and workers were often disciplined unfairly. There was no question they wanted to change their conditions, but the workers who started the organizing drive were nervous about approaching coworkers. The facility was deeply divided. The Filipino nurses did not trust the white nurses. The night shift CNAs were primarily African-American and they didn't talk to the day and evening shift who were Haitian and Jamaican. And they didn't talk to one another in any event. The custodial staff was from Central America and the Caribbean, again, sharply divided. The break room was segregated. People ate separately at different tables. They spoke their own languages. But through talking to one another in order to build a union, they came to realize that they all faced the same problems. And they came to understand that in order to fix them, they needed to work together. By the end of the campaign, and after a long but successful or partially successful statewide strike for higher pay and better staffing, the workers were singing chants in one another's languages, attending one another's family birthday parties, and debating questions of politics. My own experience is just one. It's just an anecdote for you. But the research underlines how effective inclusive labor movements can be in building solidarity across ethnic divisions and even across partisan div divisions in ways that limit the appeal of ethno-nationalism and authoritarianism. More broadly, historical experience from around the world demonstrates the role unions have played in preventing, destabilizing, and dismantling authoritarian regimes. In particular, labor movements have been central to the politics of democratization in South American, African, and Southern European transitions. Their ability to mobilize collective action, their normative commitment to democratic government, 
and their ability to advance that message among workers makes them a potent force. One problem, of course, is that unions have declined considerably in recent years. So the past decades involving increased anti-union campaigning, the rise of globalization and automation and changes in the structure of work have all weakened ties among workers and resulted in less powerful and smaller unions. And when unions are weaker, they have less ability to provide workers the experience of democracy at work, to engage workers in politics, to serve as a counterweight to organize business, to create social solidarity, and to reduce economic inequality. Thus, in countries like ours, where neoliberalism has had the most destructive effect on unions and on the organization of work, right-wing movements have found fertile ground. They are increasingly taking the place of unions as the vehicle for workers' opposition to the very real challenges they face with white working class voters in particular turning in some number to ethno-nationalist candidates. In contrast, in countries where unions have been able to maintain a stronger presence, right-wing populist movements have remained more marginal actors. Now, it's really important to state that not all unions are equally supportive of democracy. Under some authoritarian regimes, trade unions have been allied with neo-populist parties and have even functioned as arms of the authoritarian state. Meanwhile, in many countries, including ours, Law enforcement unions have tended to support authoritarian and ethno-nationalist candidates and xenophobic policies, while other unions have remained um, uh, exclusionary and somewhat bureaucratic in their orientation. And in the contemporary movement, this is increasingly becoming a more minority view. So where does that leave us? What might the path forward be? Um, many people have concluded that rebuilding unions is an impossibility. From this perspective, unions are an anachronism. They are dinosaurs. They belong to the old economy. This is the reaction I frequently get from colleagues and even from uh, colleagues in Washington, but also in, in the academy. And these scholars and commentators argue that the more responsible or pragmatic or sophisticated approach is to pursue other forms of workplace voice or other regulatory solutions to workers' problems, to think about the future of work without centering collective organization and collective power of workers. But if the goal, or a goal at least, is democracy, democracy at work and democracy in politics, I think this is a real error. Consider corporate supported forms of worker participation. These, work, these approaches have some advantages. Um, they might give workers voice, but the problem is that voice without decisional power is likely to play the key democratic roles I've discussed, to reduce economic inequality, to create social bonds through collective pursuit of a shared goal, to create independent democratic organizations that engage citizens in politics and bolster democratic institutions. And sometimes the existence of voice without organization or without real power actually erodes confidence in democracy because when voices are ignored and policies do not reflect workers' needs, the democracy isn't worth all that much. But while many commentators interested in the future of work have abandoned the ideas of unions, anti-democratic forces understand just how important unions are. In the US, even long before the rise of Trumpism, a core project among right-wing forces was to undermine democracy. And they did through, so through all the, uh, the mechanisms that we usually think about, like denying people the right to vote or burdening that right through new restrictions or engaging in gerrymandering of voting, um, districts opposing restrictions on campaign finance, weakening the media, supporting an extremely strong form of judicial review and a theory of constitutional interpretation that is based on fundamentally anti-democratic commitments, um, moving more decisions out of the realm of democratic decision-making and into the sphere of the market, so familiar moves by anti-democratic forces, but also and with extraordinary effort by attacking and dismantling unions in both the public and private sectors through a concerted multi-decade and highly funded effort. Okay, so how can we rebuild unions and how can we do so in a way that serves democratic purposes or what kind of labor law might help encourage unions to serve as pro-democratic forces? I think we can draw a few lessons from the research on how unions advance democracy and from comparative and historical experience. For unions to serve as pro-democratic forces, they need to be independent of government and they need to be independent of business. They must be strong with the ability to exert real economic and political power at the level of the work site, the economic sector, and in politics. And they themselves must be democratic and inclusive, inclusive sorry, of all races, 
ethnicities, genders, and backgrounds. So what does that mean for labor law? Our current labor law fails to effectively protect workers' rights to organize at any level, at the work site, the sector, or in the democracy. It also fails to adequately protect the right to strike, providing little protection in particular for strikes that cross employers, that build solidarity across employers, or that have political aims. And it fails to include within its ambit all workers. Actually, it explicitly excludes several sectors of the economy dominated by women and people of color, like domestic work, agricultural work, and gig work. A labor law committed to democracy would establish structures of democratic decision-making first and foremost at the level of the workplace. There are many ways to do this, including strengthening protections for organizing and bargaining under the existing National Labor Relations Act system, but also by enabling works councils or automatic organization at all work sites or democratizing corporate boards and ownership structures. But worksite bargaining is not enough. The law must also enable broader based bargaining bargaining which covers all workers in an economic sector, leaving no workers without its benefits and giving unions greater ability to exercise power over the economy and at the level of politics. In fact, firm-based bargaining tends to encourage labor leaders to prioritize short-term bread and butter needs of their own members, while broader-based bargaining tends to encourage engagement with broader problems facing society. The law also must facilitate and must require inclusive unions that cut across racial and ethnic divisions, not only by prohibiting discrimination, which it does, but also by covering workers who in the United States have been excluded from labor laws protections from the, its inception. And it must encourage and enable unions engagement in politics by creating new mechanisms for unions to participate in governmental decisions and to bargain for social welfare goods, as well as terms and conditions at work. Moreover, the, the commitment to democracy cannot be limited to formal procedures or mechanisms for voice. The law must protect workers' ability to engage in collective action through strikes and protests, not only against individual employers, but also on a sector-wide and society-wide scale with political aims as well as economic aims. Legislation pending in Congress would accomplish some, but not all of these goals. Other more ambitious proposals have been offered by labor movement actors themselves and also by academics. Uh, these urge fundamental reform of labor law to facilitate workers' real power at all three levels, the work side, the economic sector, and government. Do I think any such reform will be enacted in the next year or so? Nope, <laughs> definitely not. And even if it were, I think it's unlikely that it could withstand challenge before this Supreme Court. Yet, nonetheless, I think there's reason to be optimistic. In the past few years, workers have begun to resist their co conditions with new force. An upsurge in organizing protests and strike activity has occurred across nearly every industry, including among fast food workers, coffee baristas, teachers, Uber and Lyft drivers, hotel workers, journalists, graduate students, manufacturing workers, tech engineers, minor league baseball players, doctors, and today, uh, Hollywood writers. <laughs> For the first time ever in December 2021, a group of Starbucks workers won a union election at a corporate-owned store, <clears throat> despite an intense anti-union campaign. Over the course of 2022 and 2023, organizing drives followed at close to 300 other Starbucks stores, as well as at other high-profile firms, from Amazon to Trader Joe's to Apple and Google and numerous public and private universities, both my current and former one among them. Activity was not limited to workers new to the labor movement. In the fall of 2021, more than 20,000 worker uh, union members went on strike, including more than 10,000 at the manufacturing company, John Deere, who went on strike for the first time in 35 years. 3,000 graduate students at Columbia University, several thousand hospital and healthcare workers, 1,400 production workers for Kellogg, 450 steel workers in West Virginia, 2,000 telecommunication workers in California, 1,000 Alabama coal miners, and over 100,000 additional workers came close to striking, winning contracts after threatening work stoppages. Strikes or threatened strikes in, 2000, in 2022 surpassed the 2021 numbers by nearly 50%, and 2023 has already seen numerous strikes in a range of industries and many more likely to come. Many of these strikes take as their aim, in addition to the bread and butter pressing issues facing the workers, really important issues about terms and conditions at work, they also take as their aim issues of broader concern to the democracy. 
The thousands of, thousands of Hollywood writers who went on strike today, for example, are concerned not only with their pay, but with the impact of AI on their jobs, a concern for all of us. Chicago teachers struck not only for smaller class sizes and higher pay, but also for better social services for their students. Meanwhile, during the 2020 election, unions mobilized en masse for democracy, turning out in states like Arizona and Michigan to demonstrate in favor of peaceful and careful counting of ballots and certification of elections and against calls to overturn elections. Other unions have ramped up membership education programs focused on the problem of democracy, and they have found that workers easily make the connection between autocracy at work and growing autocratic movements in politics and are eager to fight back. These efforts, I think, are all inspiring and are worthy of optimism, but they're not enough. They pose a challenge to all of us, to those who study law and public policy, and to all of us as citizens and participants in the democracy. We cannot treat the decline of unions or the problem of autocracy at work as inevitable, and we cannot treat it as tangential to the problem of democracy. It is central to democracy. And it is critical that we work for labor law reform, for new legal structures that enable all workers in this country to organize and to help make real the promise of democracy. This may sound daunting or unrealistic, but you all at the ILR school are particularly well suited to take up this challenge. And as Professor Convitz taught Justice Ginsburg so many years ago, it is precisely when the world and the nation are not so good that we must fight even harder to make them better. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I believe we have some time for some questions, um, both uh, from within the room, but also uh, online with Jennifer's monitoring sure, online. Start uh, maybe start with an online question for uh, President Grace. Yeah. What are the primary political forces against improved labor involvement? Um, <laughs> they are significant. Um, in part, it's organized business interests. Um, and so in a number of um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association for Manufacturers, the National Association of Restauranters are extremely effective lobbyists and extremely effective litigators. And they are very, um, very skilled. And I am frequently uh, admiring of their excellent lawyering skills, um, but uh, very, very organized against any kind of law reform. Um, but it's not just limited to organized business interests. There are also, um, uh, organized efforts that are aligned with kind of broader authoritarian efforts um, against unions. So as I was saying in, in my remarks, the kind of anti-democracy program that's not just focused on economics, but is focused on voting rights and, um, and, and, and sort of more concrete or closely connected democratic efforts. Also, those institutions have married those concerns with the uh, destabilization and um, de decline of unions. That said, it's not, it's not the case that all business is equally united or equally hostile to unions. And in fact, there are a number of business groups um, that take different positions. And in the recent <laughs> state of union organizing, there are a number of employers that have decided to respect the law and follow the law, even though the econo it's economically rational in many ways for employers not to. But there are employers that have made different choices and there's business organizations that have as well. So in a number of the litigation projects I'm, I've worked on or I'm working on, there are kind of good governance business organizations that weigh in. So I think that's important to note because it is not, it, we. Um, it's not inevitable that people in the business community take the position um, that unions are bad. And in fact, there's some small but growing recognition of the importance of unions on the right in conservative circles, but also in business, um, of the need to have a social partner and the need for there to be strong organizations among workers. Um, do we have a question in the room before we go to another online one? Any, um, you, raise your hand. That's the uh, uh -huh. old-fashioned way in the room questions. For. We can go to another okay. online one. Excellent presentation. What are your assessments of President Biden's nomination for Secretary of Labor? <laughs> uh, well, the, the current nominee is a champion of labor rights. Um, she is herself from a working class immigrant background. Um, she was an amazing um, advocate for workers' rights in California um, and is an innovative um, 
uh, and um, thinker in terms of enforcement and how to best use the power of government to defend workers' rights. Um, I'll also say that current National Labor Relations Board, which is a separate agency, is the most pro-worker board we've seen in decades, far more um, aggressive and innovative and in using the statute to protect workers' rights than even the board under Obama. Um, and um, it's really kind of offering a different way to think about the protections of the statute. So, and that those are also um, political appointments. So in particular, the the general counsel um, at the National Labor Relations Board is a really um, innovative thinker about the statute and about labor rights. Um, with Roma, Patricia. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation and your chat. But I, um, as, as I was listening to you talk about the possible reforms in labor law and how to empower uh, labor unions, um, there is an ongoing debate that around like how do we reform the NLR and then there be an NRA if it is. Um, and how do we create a new system around um, that takes away the power from corporations, maybe going to a more like a sector of bargaining model that exists in Europe because the corporate model really has power over the enterprise model that is rooted in the NRA. Uh, and it's, I think there is, an, in the new organization, there's an excitement about sector of bargaining, but in some unions, they still don't see how they can move from an enterprise they were bargaining to like a more sector which we need in industries like um, distribution centers and low wage industry. So how do you, have you ever had those, come, have you ever engaged in that discussion about like, what is the real reform that we need with NRA and do we, do can, can those exist parallel? This yeah, that right. Out. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a conversation I've been deeply engaged with. And a lot of my work has focused on the need for sectoral bargaining. I think it's really important to emphasize that moving to a system or, or adding a system of sectoral bargaining does not mean abandoning worksite representation and doesn't mean abandoning grassroots democratic organization. So too often those have been posited yeah. as um, in conflict. And in, in part, um, the some, to some extent, the idea of sectoral bargaining has been um, repurposed um, by companies in certain contexts like Uber and Lyft, um, where they have used that term to really uh, describe something that is actually company unionism or weak unionism, not sectoral bargaining. Sectoral bargaining, I think, is essential in our current economy because the system of organizing worksite by worksite does not enable workers to have power against with multinational corporations. It also doesn't track the way corporations are organized. So, if a, for example, if a group of workers at a given McDonald's organize under our current system, they have the right to bargain with that franchise owner. They the law on joint employment might change, maybe under the, the board's new interpretation, they might also be able to hold, um, bring McDonald's to the table or hold McDonald's liable for labor violations. But at this point, they have the right to bargain with the franchise owner, even if they were able to get McDonald's to the table as a joint employer, one McDonald's in Ithaca is that's organized, it's not going to be able to reach a contract. And we're seeing that really clearly with the Starbucks organizing. Um, Unless you have, workers are organ, have the ability to bargain at the sectoral level and employers are forced to accept contracts that cover the whole industry as a baseline, right, with additional worksite bargaining on top of it, you leave workers in a, in this, without that sectoral bargaining system, you leave workers with very little power in the contemporary economy. Um, and, the, and there's just quite a bit of research about um, what comparing our system to other countries that have um, broader based bargaining. Um, that that supports that. Nonetheless, as you say, there is quite a bit of resistance or fear in certain quarters of the labor movement. So this this idea is very much being driven by certain parts of the labor movement, but is being also resisted by others. Um, I guess what I think um, what explains that in part is when you're in a very precarious situation, which unions are, the, anything that kind of changes the existing bureaucracy or the existing system can feel like a threat. Um, but I think it's a mistake to hold on to what we have at the expense of not actually fighting for a system that really is fair for all workers. Um, and I had one other thought, but it'll come back to me. Uh, another question in the room, uh, Colleen. So thank you so much, this was uh, inspiring. Um, it seems clear from my perspective that organized business, at least the 
a nastier side of organized business have a constitutional vision of what it is that they're doing and how all of the parts, the moving parts, the court, the administration, and um, social movements um, fit into that vision. And if I compare that to the labor movement, labor movement has more of a tactic where we have a good board, we go to the board, if we have a bad board, we can avoid the board. So my question is, do you think it's necessary for the labor movement to adopt a broader constitutional vision um, their relations with the law um, more generally? And, and if so, what that vision might look like? I, I love that question. Um, I'll say just a few words for people who are less familiar with the litigating strategy of the of business and of the Chamber of Commerce on what that business constitutional vision looks like, because it is, um, in my view, pretty terrifying um, and much more expansive than is sometimes realized when you look at issues in kind of doctrinal silos. Um, so the um, if you take a look overall at the constitutional arguments that are being pressed by business, it would admit, it would really put us back into a pre-New Deal era in a number of different ways. So one is with respect to First Amendment arguments that are being made where the, cha where the chamber and others have argued that any regulation that requires businesses to do something they don't want to do is a violation of their free speech rights. Um, that sounds kind of ludicrous, but it actually got three votes on the district of the DC circuit in a case <laughs> involving whether or not the employer could be required to just post the law. The um, the um, uh, we got two votes, um, but um, the another uh, the idea that um, that 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 idea of compelled speech um, is is um, has a number of supporters on the Supreme Court. So the First Amendment is one. The takings clause is another. So the um, notion that it is a taking, an unconstitutional taking of property to require, um, to allow union organizers onto a California farm, for example. Um, those are maybe more familiar, but we're also seeing in the pleadings um, in, the, in other cases, arguments that um, legislation that targets, for example, one kind of company for a higher minimum wage or for health and safety violates the equal protection rights of those companies or violates their due process rights, right? These are arguments that were abandoned after the New Deal, um, universally abandoned, and they're, they're being made again, and they're getting uptake from conservative judges. Um, so, and then I think maybe most problematically is the, um, the concerted effort to dismantle the administrative state, um, and um, both um, to uh, remove any deference to administrative agencies, but also to say that um, it is unconstitutional for administrative agencies to be given power to execute the law, um, that that violates kind of principles of delegation. If the court kind of keeps pursuing that line, it will eviscerate the ability to protect workers' rights at the federal level. Um, and then the private non-delegation doctrine, which was never repudiated after the New Deal, um, is a real obstacle to any kind of social bargaining like exists in European countries or um, other industrial democracies. So there is a very coherent and cohesive and expansive constitutional agenda being pressed by the right. Um, I think there is also a coherent constitutional agenda being pressed by certain kind of sectors of the labor movement. And I would, it's not often phrased in express constitutional terms. But I think there's good reason for that because when you articulate claims in constitutional terms, you, um, under our system of extreme judicial supremacy, you um, basically give courts kind of particular authority over those claims. So I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know that the problem is that the labor movement isn't arguing the First Amendment, um, because I think that just, um, so for example, if you think about administrative agencies, if you make an argument in terms of first, the First Amendment to an administrative agency, that agency is entitled to no deference um, from courts in terms of its interpretation. Well, we might be in that world for everything in a few months anyway, but, but at least now, right, it's particularly dangerous to make constitutional arguments. But I actually think there is a constitutional vision and I think it has um, several parts. I mean, one is that basics, um, constitutional ideals of due process and democracy should apply in the private sector as well as the public sector. So that's a, you know, that really goes at this, the, the uh, public private divide that is so pervasive in American constitutional law and American law. And I think there is a, a vision to try to dismantle that. It's incipient, it's not articulated as such, but I think you see it in the legislative efforts of the labor movement. The second is, um, is social welfare entitlements, right? And again, not all, not everyone in labor. There's definitely real factions that oppose universal 
minimum wage increases or just cause laws or, um, but there is a movement to try to uh, create social welfare entitlements. And again, that pushes against kind of the constitutional vision, not just of the right, but also kind of the post New Deal liberal settlement. Um, the third is in, like actual inclusion so that all workers are members of the polity or equal members of the polity entitled to rights under the law. And again, very contested within the labor movement, but uh, um, but is a part of that vision. And then the fourth, I would say, is a more democratic state. So ideas of things like wage boards, workers' boards, where workers actually have a seat at the table in defining policy. Um, so I see that actually as a as an eminent constitutional vision, um, although um, you know under theorized or not quite you know not explicit, but it, as an important one. I'm I'm less sure that it makes sense to be making express constitutional arguments because those are just losers at this point. At least. They might, it's helpful rhetorically. And actually, if you look at statements from Sarah Nelson or Mary Kay Henry, you actually do see them invoking sometimes the 13th Amendment or the First Amendment. So it's not, but as a kind of legal strategy, it's not, um, it would be, a, it would be a, a losing one at this point, given the courts. Gosh, maybe we do an online question and then we'll go back into the room. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, someone asks, how about labor law reform that prohibits permanent replacement of economic strikers? Employers' ability to, to, per, to permanently replace economic strikers severely limits the ability to win economic gains, and that, in turn, limits unions' ability to win organizing campaigns. That is an absolutely essential reform, um, and it is part of the PRO Act, which is the legislation that's pending in Congress. What I think is also really interesting, and this is an exam question I've frequently given my labor law students in the past, is there's ways to get there even without legislative reform because the prohibition on permanent, uh, the permission to permanently replace is not something that's actually in the statute. It came from dicta in an early Supreme Court opinion, but this um, general counsel is actually kind of moving in that direction with interpretations that would erode or would limit the ability of employers to permanently replace. But it's an absolutely essential and it has to be codified. And in my view, ultimately, is something that should be protected under the Constitution. Again, not not kind of a viable argument before this court, but one that is you know quite doctrinally sound or sound in terms of um, I think in terms of constitutional interpretation. So I'm in complete agreement with that question that it's an essential reform. A gentleman at the back. Here. Is it really, you started with the concentration of wealth in this country and the limited number of people that are exerting all the power. Wouldn't limiting the corporate power, invoking the antitrust acts again and trying to break these things up so that there aren't so few people controlling so much, an easier goal to achieve and protect our democracy? Um, I think that's an essential goal as well. Um, and I think that what, one of the things that's exciting right now is that we see new interpretations of antitrust law um, that would both break up companies, um, or more aggressive use of the antitrust laws to break up companies, but also use of antitrust laws to um, get an anti-competitive conduct in the labor market. Um, and so I think using, uh, having a kind of a broad anti-monopoly theory and a broad um, use of the antitrust laws is essential. On antitrust law, I think it's also critical that it not be used against workers. Um, so under the existing antitrust law, um, it's not clear whether non-employees can take can benefit from the labor exemption. So it's not clear whether independent contractors or people classified as independent contractors like gig workers, if they get together to try to raise their wages, is that anti-competitive activity? So this, um, the leadership of this FTC has taken, has, has essentially adopted kind of the view you're articulating, which is that we need to break up concentration of wealth. We also need to use the antitrust laws in ways that, that um, break up um, policy or that um, limit the ability of employers to impose anti-competitive um, uh, policies that you know, prevent workers from, say, moving from one company to another and not use antitrust laws to limit workers' ability to get together. But I don't think anti-monopoly policy or antitrust law is enough because while breaking up businesses is, can be important, it doesn't necessarily translate into worker power. And so one example is in the early, in the 1920s, prior to the New Deal, one of the most um, least concentrated industries was garment, you know, very fissured industry. 
not big concentration. Um, and yet the labor conditions and government were terrible. And so, so just, just breaking up companies um, doesn't necessarily improve workers' working conditions or give workers power um, in, the, in politics. So both strategies, I think, are important and they work together. Um, and then one, la one last reaction is that um, um, in the past, in the um, earlier parts of our history, the labor movement has been a more active voice in favor of a broad anti-monopoly vision. Um, and I think there's an important, um, there's an important, Need, there's a need for that, right? For for work for an understanding of the relationship between a, a pro worker policy and a and a broad anti monopoly policy. Uh, maybe do an online yeah. um, question. Who are your allies in the academic community, and what are they doing to advance the ideas that you have expressed today? Uh, well, there's lots of them, <laughs> including most people uh, here. Uh, no, I mean, I think um, I, I actually think there's uh, quite a bit of consensus among people who study labor um, and labor markets about the things I talked about. So problems of facing workers are so acute and, um, and widely recognized. And I, that, um, you know, there's obviously debates about kind of what the best reform strategies are, what the best policies are. But I think most people who study labor um, are, uh, deeply concerned about the state of the, the problems facing American workers, understand the connection between labor and democracy, um, and think about these problems. Um, I think that um, that is less true in for with people who focus on other fields. Um, we're starting to see more concern about wealth concentration in um, actually in among antitrust scholars um, and among corporate law scholars. Um, but historically, um, those fields have kind of not engaged with these problems. Uh, Christine, uh, at the back there. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your amazing lecture. Um, my question is in regards to uh, the idea that not all unions are democratic and sometimes are exclusive. So <laughs> what are some of those remedies that can kind of cure? I mean, does it look like a quota? Um, and especially when you have workers that have this fear of deportation because they're not protected. Yeah, so um, to be clear, like just to back up for a moment for people aren't as well as familiar with the law, uh, um, the, the black letter law is that labor law does protect and does include undocumented workers and immigrant workers. But in practice, because of um, the reality that um, those workers are particularly vulnerable to retaliation and remedies um, are both poor for everybody or weak for everyone, but are particularly weak for undocumented workers. Um, in practice, uh, um, immigrant workers in particular are very vulnerable um, in organizing. Um, so what, um, what are the remedies? Well, one, in terms of um, statutory reform, a critical reform is that all workers in all industries have the right to organize. Um, and so agricultural workers, for example, have uh, do not have organizing rights under federal law. Um, and that was part of a, a compromise essentially with Southern Democrats at, during the New Deal. And even now, um, we were talking about this earlier, the PRO Act would not extend uh, rights to agricultural workers. Um, Domestic workers um, need a different system of organizing. One, it has to be one that's more sectoral because um, you can't, you know, that it's such an individual employment relationship, but um, also excluded. So one, you know, one statutory necessity is provide is extending rights to workers who are excluded. Um, and not making uh, the whether you have kind of basic rights uh, at work or the right to organize turn on, for example, whether you're classified as an employee. Um, the um, I think the question, and then uh, we have very, we actually have very strong protections against discrimination within unions, um, and those have been pretty successful. So there's been like a really significant change in the internal kind of culture of unions um, from the 1940s and 50s to the present through legal mechanisms that that require non-discrimination, a duty of loyalty, a duty of a duty of good, um, good of fair representation, essentially in unions. Um, however, um, there are other there are other things I think that could be done as well. Um, so, um, one one thing I actually just learned about recently is that the law actually prohibits anybody who has a conviction 
from serving as a union um, representative or even like a delegate or a steward. Um, so that was something that was imposed um, as a fear of corruption, right? Makes sense. We don't want, um, we don't want corrupt uh, union leadership. Um, but the effect of that is, um, particularly in unions that represent a lot of low income African American men, is that those people have no right to serve um, as leaders of their own unions because of the statute um, and because of the Department of Labor's really conservative interpretation of the statute. So there's a lot of um, kind of other ways in which the law um, limits uh, or kind of reifies or um, problems of um, race and society in the labor context. Um, I think the question of how to, the, of internal union democracy is a, is a really hard one and not one that I have good answers to because there's a tension between, I think that it's critical that unions be internally democratic, that they engage their members, that they are, that they are really run by their members. Um, but it's not necessarily, I, I, it's not clear to me at least, I, I, both because I haven't studied it deeply enough, because, but also because I think there's really hard issues, whether more legal regulation of the internal operation of unions is the best path forward or not. There's a lot of laws that already kind of govern in the internal um, regulation of unions and whether more would help, I'm, I'm really not sure about that. Thank you. Uh, Risa, you have your hand up. Yeah, no, thanks so much. Um, so I'm kind of a twofold. I mean, the first thing I keep being drawn back to is, is the historical kinds of uh, issues that you're talking about, like just the one in terms of internal union regulation, right? Union democracy is a good thing. Why was it passed with Landon Griffin in 1959 was anti-communism, the assumption that the unions were simply mafia, you know, riddled the basically anti-labor, um, you know, um, a motivation in passing those laws and to weaken the labor movement. So you get union democracy, yay, that's a good thing, but why bad thing? And, and so there are these kind of contradictions that make it very difficult, I think, to, to tease those out. Um, and, and also historically, I think it's important to remember that um, the CIO in purging its leftist unions, you know, really cut its heart out. And so to some extent, I think historically trying to build a labor movement has been trying to kind of heal from that. So I thought, you know, this might add some thoughts here. Yeah, I think that's, yes. I, I completely agree with you. I'll, again, just to tell a personal anecdote, the union that I started organizing with was 1199 New England, which was part of the healthcare workers union, ultimately merged with SEIU, but it um, had escaped those purges in large part because healthcare workers weren't covered by the act until the late 1970s. And so it was a, the most leftist union. It was run by the New York Jewish communists, basically, and socialists um, for a long time. Um, the, um, the purging of not just communists from unions, but of anyone who is a sympathizer of the sort of left ideals um, was, a, was a really uh, problematic and, and um, you know, anti-democratic part of, of union history. Um, I, I don't know that I have that much uh, to add to what you've said beyond that. Um, and that I do, th I think you're right that there's, there's all sorts of um, ways in which um, the laws that were kind of passed with either anti-corruption aims or, or, or kind of posited as anti-corruption or internal democracy were, were motivated by other um, goals as well and also had negative aims as well. But I, but I think that we can think about changing those without abandoning the idea of union democracy, because I do think it's really important for union um, unions to be internally democratic. We'll do an online question just to, oh no, okay. Uh, gentlemen here, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, I'm just wondering, like my question is about like from uh, varieties of capitalism literature, we see like coordinated market economies are more likely to favor the union activism than uh, liberal market economy. So I'm just wondering uh, if we can really be hopeful can, about the same level of uh, union activism under the mode of production that we see in the liberal market economy as opposed to the coordinated market economies. Yeah, I think that the kind of um, coordinated social bargaining that I am suggesting requires changes on the side of capital as well, right? And um, you're absolutely right that unless we have more kind of economic planning and more coordination on the side of employers, it's very hard to imagine how you'd have an effective system of social welfare bargaining or uh, sectoral bargaining. Um, so it requires rethinking and um, structures to rebuild uh, um, the capital side of things as well. 
Um, and there's great, I mean, the literature um, is, is, is really interesting um, on, on those issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another question. Just one last comment. I would just like to hear your perspective. Um, you know, I am more of a social scientist, political scientist. So, um, you know, I the law to me is, uh, it comes out of like the norms that society sets for itself. It's like norming, right? So we're in the process. Um, so, and what changes uh, the norms is the social movement activity that's around it. So I just wanted to ask you, like in your, in your evaluation of the work that you're doing, uh, how much hope do you take from the, from the social movement activity at the moment to actually change the norms so that we can change the law? Yeah. Because that's the only way we're going to. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you that I don't think that change happens from above, that there's some, you know, kind of ideal world in which we might kind of impose labor law reform that will then change everything, right? If there is going to be labor law reform, it is only going to be, it will be because of social movements. Um, and same thing with kind of changes on constitutional ideas. If you think about how we've changed, how constitutional interpretation and ideas about the constitution have changed in this country, it has come about when there's mass social movements. So as important as Justice Ginsburg's litigation was with respect to women's rights and equal protection, none of that would have been successful or would have come about without the women's movement um, and without organizing on the ground. Um, that said, I do think law can play a role in helping, in, it's a dialectical relationship, right? Where law can help build social movements. So um, I, I've written with um, Ben Sachs um, at Harvard, we've been trying to think about how, um, how law structures social movements and organizations and how it could do so differently. And to kind of start from the premise that, you know, there are already lots of ways in which law allows certain kinds of coordination and disallows other kinds of coordination or allows certain kinds of social movements and disallows others. And so to think about it, are there ways that law reform could help encourage social movement organization among working people, not only as workers, but also as tenants, as debtors, as public benefits recipients. And that, and to, um, and so, um, so while I agree with you, right, that that we need to see kind of norm changes and social movement changes before we're going to see major law changes, I think law, law can also help facilitate the growth of social movements and but and often works to to dampen them as well. Uh, we're a little over time, but I think we had a great <laughs> set of questions. I want to thank Fritz and Brad for